This is B2B Enablement, a Click.io podcast created to inspire sales and marketing leaders navigating digital transformation. I'm your host, Dave Carr, and on this show, we'll share actionable insights to build winning digital strategies and deliver better sales results with your customers. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of B2B Enablement. Today, we've got a really interesting topic that we want to dive into. We're going to talk about how the manufacturing sector has been fundamentally changed and disrupted in the wake of COVID-19. So many changes have happened since the beginning of 2020. And I think if you're in this industry and you live this every day, you will know that this is totally unlike anything that we've seen in the past decade, if not two decades. Uh, probably the most disruption since the Great Recession. So on this podcast today, what we're going to do is take an excerpt of a webinar conversation that I recently had with a gentleman named Joe Mills, who is a senior executive at a company called Element3, which does marketing and, and research for companies primarily in the industrial and manufacturing sector. And Joe and his team at Element3 recently put together a really, really good inclusive industry report about the effects of 2020 on the manufacturing industry. So in the excerpt of the webinar that I'm going to share here, Joe goes really in depth on a couple of key things. They've identified several challenges uh, overall that the industry is facing, and those are changing buyer behaviors event uncertainty. So basically, what are we going to do now that we can't go to trade shows and do things live like we used to? Also, the challenge of hiring, uh, just in general, the labor shortages, how you are trying to attract and more importantly, retain talent during this very uncertain time. And then finally, the massive amount of disruption that has happened in the supply chain recently. So each of those points, uh, Joe's going to cover and give details I'm going to put in the show notes a link to the report. So if you want to read through the formal report put out by Element 3 on all of these topics, you'll have those resources there. I will also include a link to Joe's uh, PowerPoint that he shared in this webinar, as well as a link to the on-demand webinar uh, itself if you want to watch it all in its entirety. So sit back, relax. I think you'll really enjoy these points from Joe, and I hope you walk away with some really good, insightful information. I know I certainly did. Here we go. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Dave and Paul. I really appreciate being on. Excited to share today, and hopefully we share some things that people can take action out of and can have some real real impact for them across their organizations. So yeah, Manufacturing Trend Report, we put this together over the course of the last, about the turn of the years, where we really started hammering home on the topics that we found inside of this and the, the topics and conversations that we were having with business leaders across the board. Uh, and really trying to think about it from the standpoint of, hey, 2020 changed a lot or accelerated a lot. What's going to be a lasting impact versus what is going to be a blip? So that was the headspace that we went into this work with. And first question I'd be asking if I was, watching this, I'd be saying, hey, why should I listen to this? What gives this validity? And so it's helpful to understand where the research came from, what we talk, who we talked to, and where it came from for ourselves. So like Paul mentioned, I work for Element3. We are a marketing firm that serves a lot of different industries, but about 60% of our business is inside of the manufacturing slash industrial industry. Some of that is B2B to C. Companies like Airstream and Numar sort of big toys that adults buy that are sold through dealership networks. And then some of them are directly B2B, composite material, technology companies, uh, material handling companies, people who do not sell something that's sexy, but people who sell something that's extremely important for the the product, honestly, for the entire world that we live in to function. Um, And so I like to think of them them as kind of the forgotten heroes of, of, frankly, the world. Um, who make things that make the world go around. So we have a lot of client experience in that. And that was one major input as we were looking through this report was what are our clients experiencing right now? It's not just happening on one client, but it's happening across this large book of business that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second piece was we read industry leaders, right? We, we, lead, we read people who lead the consulting industry as a whole. So Price, Waterhouse, Cooper, McKinsey, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, you know, the major consulting firms, 
the research coming out of those firms that are cited in this report throughout uh, really backed up what we were experiencing with our clients. And that was really the trigger point at which we said, okay, there's something here that we should go investigate further that we think we can contribute to the conversation based on what we're seeing and what we're learning with our clients. And then the third input was I was fortunate enough to connect with 20 plus, I think it ended up being about 23 primary interviews with business leaders across a variety of companies and company sizes. And we'll show you who we talked to here in a second. But this was really interesting because I talked to people from CEOs to CMOs, talked to a couple of chief financial officers, all the way down to say VP of sales, VP of marketing, people with titles, VP of innovation, and even a couple of marketing directors sprinkled in throughout. But mostly I wanted to talk to people who were in charge of creating future value for their organization. And how was what was happening inside of 2020, not just COVID, but other things as well. How was that impacting their ability to, to do their job effectively? And then clicking down into that, how were their marketing instances changing? How were their sales teams being affected? How were things that really impacted their bottom lines being impacted by all the happenings in 2020? So those were the three inputs that we took as we put this trend report together. And I, I think it's important to call out, we, we call it a trend report, but these are lasting, so not a fad report. These are things that we're seeing over time that are continuing to be real um, that I hope as you're looking at, you're like, yep, I'm still feeling that. Yep, I'm still feeling that. And I think some of them from the conversations I have have been going on even before COVID just got accelerated a lot from the pandemic and all the outcomes from it. So some of the companies that we talked to, I referenced, we work with Airstream, been working with Airstream for almost a decade now um, and a variety of companies who are similar to them. We also spoke with uh, leaders of you know Fortune 500 size companies like Caterpillar, um, all the way down to regional leaders like Polygon Composite Technologies. And those are very opposite ends of the spectrum. Intentionally, we didn't want to only focus on Fortune 500, Fortune 100 biggest companies in the world. We also wanted to talk to people who are really regional leaders and understand is what the giant company like Caterpillar experiencing similar or the same as what the small company who has regional focus and regional footprint at this point, but trying to grow into that national and global brand. How are those pieces similar? So this is just a smattering of some of the people that we talked to to show breadth of, of understanding and, and who we had the experience with. So hopping in, we're going to go through four challenges that the report identifies. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about are um, definitely seen in the report. And I'm going to throw in a couple little tidbits as well that didn't feel like they came across great in print, like it, hard to communicate without a conversation. And I think it might be some conversation starters for us today as well. So the first one, broadly speaking, just changing buyer behaviors and changing buyers. This is like trying to play, play catch up. What I heard consistently from, from business leaders is not that digital transformation wasn't already taking place. That was already going on. They had plans in place for that. They had a hey, three-year timeline. Here's what we need to do. Here's the future. Here's when our buyer is going to leave. This is when a new buyer is going to get hired. This is how the buying committee is changing. All those things were, were on the horizon. But they were on the horizon and they were, you know, six to 10 years out. This happened like that, like COVID happened and then it was acceleration across the board somewhere, like I said, between that six to 10 year sort of acceleration. And so that piece, that main digital transformation piece was one of the first things that we observed with both our clients coming out of companies like McKinsey and with people that I was speaking to inside of this, this interview process. It was like, hey, we knew we needed to update our website, the way our buyers experienced our products, all these things, but it had to happen faster. And instead of a three-year timeline, it is now a six-month timeline. And we are actively in that project or we're looking for somebody to find it. I would say inside of the digital transformation bucket and inside of all of these, there were really three groups of people. One, I have a plan and I'm executing it. Two, I have a plan and I'm looking for a partner. And three, I don't have a plan and I don't know where to start. And I'm, I'm terrified of that fact because I know it's going to catch up to me. And this third group is the one who was really the most uncomfortable about where they sat. The other two felt like, hey, one, I'm already executing and I just had to go faster. Two, you know, I've got to find an execution partner now. This is important for me. And then three is like, I'm scared and I need some direction. Inside of that, the expanded lead generation activities really touches on the idea that for a long time, manufacturing companies, industrial companies relied on trade shows, relied on conferences, in-person events to drive a book of business. I, marketing sales leaders told me across the board, 
yeah, we would go to these set shows. We'd get a list of leads from there and we would work on a long sales cycle, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months beyond with these new contacts to build a relationship and eventually turn those into sales. Those lead generation activities couldn't exist inside of 2020 at all for the most part. And so that became, okay, well, now we have to figure out how to drive leads through digital infrastructure, through virtual events, which everybody and their brother threw up and decided they were important. And I would say most people attended them and, and had a meh sort of experience. They didn't have the networking. They didn't have the opportunity to meet people. And so as companies looked to expanding lead generation activities, those turned into a variety of pieces from first, first time doing paid ads. What's how am I using social media? Is LinkedIn an avenue for me now? What's the message I need to get out? And all the way down to like, oh crap, I don't have a message to get out. I need to figure that out and start working on my lead generation. The third bullet point here talking about buyer control versus sales control. In the D to C world, right? You think about buying a pair of shoes or um, buying even, you know, at home technology like a computer, for example. I, the buyer, am going online or or going to their various digital platforms, and I'm owning the control of the process. I'm clicking on the information that I want to know when I want to know it. I'm putting the piece into my cart. I'm buying it on my terms. That's been happening for decades now, right? Really since the internet became everyday parlance, that has been starting to take shape in the D2C form. For the B2B world and for the industrial manufacturing world, this is relatively new. Sales teams used to still control that process. They had all the information. They gave it to the buyer when they wanted to, and they controlled the pace of that conversation. McKinsey came out with a study that showed more than, I think it was 86% of buyers in the industrial world want to own that process. They want to go get the information when they want to get it. They want a product demo when they want a product demo, whether that's 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, 11 p.m. on a Sunday night or 9 a.m. on a Monday when you might have scheduled a normal call. They want to be able to look at those things when they want them. And so the control in the sales process is moving over to the buyer at a really accelerated rate. This also simply has to do with the fact that more than 70% of buyers inside of a buying group are from a millennial generation now. They are used to buying things on their terms when they want to through digital channels. And that also leads into the other main piece that I took away from one of the McKinsey reports that I read is that people are no longer just buying computers and you know a couple thousand dollar purchases online. There are many industrial buyers who are spending north of a million dollars online without talking to a sales team. They are making CapEx decisions without talking to your sales team. So the way that they're experiencing your product, your service, your company as a whole online just simply has to improve to a level that it can support that sort of decision making, or you're probably going to be left behind. And then finally, sales and marketing technology. Um, this one is very interesting. You can run into $100 million, $200 million, $500 million companies who are running their marketing and their sales activities out of Excel spreadsheets and Outlook inboxes. No technology put into place. And the challenge for that is that there really is nowhere to go look and find your customers or learn about them. And so we've seen an immense improvement across the board and a focus on implementing things like a CRM, marketing automation platform, whether that's a Salesforce, it's HubSpot, or hey, we have a lot of clients who have a, a HubSpot instance for marketing, and then they're using their ERP that's proprietary to them, but they, maybe they even built it that they are using both as a CRM and their ERP. So that sort of technology platform setup is, is a huge piece that people are starting to focus on. All that being said, what do we do about it, right? What are the solutions that we should be focused on as marketers and sales leaders inside of this space? One of the first ones is getting your technology set up to be a central source of truth for your organization. Operating inside of you know, 14 different spreadsheets with 500 customers per spreadsheet it gets very cumbersome for your sales team to both use, manage and maintain, frankly, prune, keep accurate and record things like interactions. What content have they seen? What questions do they ask? How do I use that to inform my marketing? So getting set up on a, a solid CRM, a good marketing automation platform, um, 
and linking that into your ERP and into your website so that you have a central source of truth that you can go to to learn about your customer more is really imperative. And it leads into the second point here. One of the pieces that a lot of industrial companies are missing now is updating that customer experience map. Maybe they haven't done that formal process before. And so getting into it for the first time, but if they have also updating, well, I have a new customer now. I've got more millennial buyers. They want different things from me. What is the experience that I need to give them as customers, both before they talk to my brand before or in my sales team, before they interact with my sales team directly and they're just interacting by brand all the way through the sales process and then into onboarding and in their post-sale experience as a customer? What does that experience look like and what are they asking for? As you learn that, using that to dictate what is the digital infrastructure that I need to build that makes that doable. For example, okay, yes, a website update is an obvious thing that we can do from a digital infrastructure standpoint. Communicate who we serve, why we're different, what's our main value prop. But also things like, oh, I need a dealer login, right? Or I need a supplier portal that they can log in, see orders, what is my status, all those kinds of questions that happen on the back end. Instead of picking up the phone, calling somebody, calling their buddy who they have a great relationship with on your sales team, rather being able to go get that information when they need it on demand at real time. So those were three solutions that we found to be very impactful for industrial uh, companies when you're focusing on that first challenge of changing buyers. Yep. Awesome. I think customer experience mapping is, is so important and overlooked by a lot of teams these days. Dave and I talk about it quite a bit, the buyer's journey and really understanding where our customers go and how they navigate I guess just one question that I have specifically is, I mean, for teams who don't map their customers currently, where do you suggest they start? How would they get an understanding of that process and and kind of the flow a customer goes through? Yeah, great question. I like to start with ideal customers in that situation and to look at your past ones. So I feel like every organization has their, you know, two to three just all-star clients that they love working with, their repeat business, they buy from them every time the product updates. Um, I would go back and look at and say, okay, how did they come into our organization in the first place? What was the thing that they did? Now, if this is a legacy client that came in 25 years ago, they're not going to inform you. So pick one of your most recent favorite customers, best customers, and say, how did they come into my organization? What was the experience that they, what were the questions they asked the sales team? What were the steps in the process like? After they said yes, how did we follow up? How did we build that relationship? And then map what was probably a lot of personal work, in-person work, map that to what can my digital infrastructure do? What can it answer ahead of time? What we're not trying to say to do is replace your sales team and that bespoke experience with technology and with marketing materials, but rather to complement it and make it more robust. Give your sales team more assets to use. And also give your buyer more information before they have to ask for it. They want it when they want it. So go back and see what are the things they asked. Learn about your buyer. Like Build a really good buyer persona or an ideal customer profile that tells you what is the experience this ideal customer had with me. And now how how do I make that happen again and again and again? And that's the map you're trying to draw. Absolutely. And you know, one thing I'll add to that, because I, I, I actually watched this happen, and I'll give you an example from my old world in electrical distribution. One pitfall you can go into in that is trying to create a customer map based on legacy customers. So for instance, if you know you need to grow into new areas or that the demographics are changing, don't go grab a customer that's been your client for 25, 30 years and try to build a map around that. I'll give you a great example. This is a funny story. So when I was running marketing and electrical distributor, we were trying to you know promote e-commerce, right? We have a new website. We've done updates. We want to talk to customers that have used our website. So what do we do? We put out a note to our sales team. Hey, tell us customers that are using the website. We'd love to interview them. Well, one of our sales guys raises his hand. So our chief digital officer, an executive of the company, gets in the car with the salesperson, drives two and a half hours south to go meet them to talk about how they use our website. Come to find out the way that they were using the website is they would literally go on, look at stock, take a piece of paper, write their PO, fax it, pick up the phone, call their salesperson and say, hey, did you get it? And then would wait and sit there and click the refresh button on the website to see if the quantity went down to know that his order was placed. Wow. So that's the dangerous part, right? So if you look at legacy processes... And, and if you're on this call and you're in a manufacturing, you can probably relate to that story. It happens all over the place. And that's the challenge. Like we're trying to get people to go from that to 
the experience we have with Google. And to your point, Joe, like those 73% of millennials that are now a part of those buying committees, you cannot build your customer experience on legacy process and legacy yep. clients. It doesn't work. 100%. I mean, to, to your point, that buyer has changed so much. They're not willing to do that. Absolutely. They are not going to refresh. They, are, they need order confirmation. They need post-sale updates. They right. need to know that it's been shipped. They need to know when to expect it. Because look, we're not different people when we come to work. We don't like wake up in the morning, take a shower, have breakfast, have coffee, go to the office or stay at home, whatever we do now, and turn into a different person when we walk into our work environment. We're still used to buying things like we do up from Amazon. We go home, we're like, oh man, I need a new water bottle. One click buy, order confirmation, shipping confirmation, expected delivery confirmation. Are you going to be there? Like all this stuff is automatic. And so that's what I've come to expect now when I purchase, regardless of where I'm purchasing at. Yep. And my patience level, and I see it inside of myself and this, you know, somebody who is adjacent to you know, the manufacturing world and sees like, oh, there's a lot to, that goes into making these things come to life. Even somebody like myself has the expectation that it just should be seamless and easy. And so that's what your buyer is starting to think. Like it should be seamless and easy. I don't want to fax it. I do not want to refresh my website page. I want to know that it happened. And then you just tell me that without me having to pick up the phone. Yep. And I think the big takeaway for me is if you are building your business model around a client or a customer group that is at risk of going extinct, so is your business, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're building your model around the whole, let's fax it, pick up the phone, refresh the page, that's where you're at risk. So to your point, Joe, it is that balance of, digital infrastructure, how do you reach those new clients? And it, it, it does require a lot of different thinking and it's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, you know, for us to sit here on the call, share some information. Yeah, it's easy to report this, but the, the actual application is difficult. And the yes. one thing we talk about all the time is it's one step at a time. You know, it's, it's understanding what that long journey looks like and then how technology relates to go into it. So. Yeah. hundred percent. Yep. All right. So challenge number two, shifting gears a little bit, I'm, I'm referenced events underneath the lead generation activity question, but there was a lot of uncertainty around events as we were having these conversations. And I, I think that if you would have asked them about, a, you know, two months later, there might've been more certainty, but now with the Delta variant popping up, different, different states inside of the US going to different rules and regulations, different countries having rules and regulations, this is back to being a very uncertain thing. So it, it feels very applicable right now. And the main question is like, who's going? That was the, one of the main things we heard. So as we had these conversations, this was the biggest one that had zero alignment across the board. So in my, in my 23 conversations with business leaders, I didn't hear a lot of the same ideas coming out again and again and again. I heard a lot of one giant shrug of, I just don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Um, I feel uncomfortable making decisions. It actually reminded me a lot of what people were talking like when COVID first really reared its head, you know, March of 2020, when that was going on and people didn't know what's the timeline, how long am I going to be inside of this work from home order? Um, I know for a lot of industrial companies who are, you know, who are considered, um, now I'm losing the term, essential, there it is, who are considered essential, a lot of the world didn't change. You were able to go to the office, you were doing your normal thing, but your business environment changed a lot. And so it didn't give you a lot of information in order to make decisions. That feels like what people are feeling now around events. I don't know what to expect. Therefore, I don't know what I should budget. Therefore, I don't know how to make decisions. Where should I go? Who's going to be there, et cetera. All of that being said, people did reference, hey, the virtual event thing doesn't work for networking. I do not get to meet the people I want to meet. I do not get to build the relationships that I am used to building. Year over year, I'll give you an example. This is a, a company here in Indiana. They said they go to the same four shows every year. It supplies their pipeline for the year. And they meet the same people year over year intentionally. They're like, this is the one time I get to catch up with that, with that potential buyer. It normally takes us two years to get a new client. It's our really long sales cycle, very long contract when we, when we get them sold. So I need to meet with them in person on a cadence. That's how this works. They're like, that does not exist. I lost that year in 2020. I didn't have any opportunity to do it. So the networking piece still matters a lot. Now, the question inside of that is, who's, is, who's going? 
are the people that you want to connect with and stay connected with actually going to be in attendance? I talked to uh, some uh, Coke Industries, one of the ones that I, I referenced on that slide, and they said, hey, our sales team isn't going to the shows. Our engineering team isn't going to the show over here that we normally go to. They're like, so I just don't know. We don't know what the impact is going to be, but we're not attending because we didn't lose anything in 2020 not attending. And so we're staying without attending. Well, if you're somebody who's trying to sell in that company and you show up at that show expecting them to be there and they're not there, you've just wasted your flight, time, hotel, food, whatever marketing materials put together slash sales collateral. Maybe you bought a booth. Like all those pieces was for one client or one prospective client. And now you're like, wow, they're not even here. That's really tough. Uh, one of the things that I'll get into in the solution side, but I'll just reference it right here. We had a client who was um, getting asked by the show that they normally go to, Hey, are you coming? Do you want to sponsor? And this person trying to sell them on the show was dancing around the question of attendance levels. And we finally said to him and said, Hey, Steve, his name is Steve. He said, Steve, you need to ask them for a list of who's in attendance, who has signed up, gave it to them. It was 30% of 2019. That is how much lower the attendance levels are happening. Be, be careful with where you go and, and what you commit to without getting your information. I feel for attendance or for event companies on those sorts of challenges, but you need to make sure that you are getting the information that you need. Yeah. The other thing we observed is that this goes back into your legacy point as well, Dave. People have been going to events for so long that they started going 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 25 years ago to the same show. And it's, it's grown and evolved and become a bigger deal. But at no point in that time do they think, I need to set a measurement for the impact that this show, event, conference is having on my business. Yes. So when we ask the question of, why do you go to that? And they're like, oh, we just always been. Oh, like, what does it do for your business? I'm not totally sure. I think we meet people. But <laughs> oh, okay, so there's no measurement in place. Yeah, not really. Okay, got it. So it's very normal to not have measurement in place for events. But it's one of the first things that I'm going to talk about here in what we rec recommend on our solutions. Really, from the top, this is a great opportunity to reset your event strategy and the way that you go to trade shows and conferences. So number one, set some realistic expectations. As you're setting those KPIs and you're setting out what are the measurements I'm going to have, don't do things like, I am going to sell all of my new business from these two events. Probably not real right now. I'm going to close the two whales that I need a year. Probably not real right now. Find the realistic expectation you can expect from events, recognizing attendance is going to be a little bit lower. My networking is probably going to take a little bit of a hit. What should I expect from this event? What is the dual value I can get out of it? With that in mind, right size your budget, right? Let's say you're normally going to a show, you're sponsoring, you're sending your seven salespeople, and you're building out a trade show booth, you're building out sales collateral, and you're spending six figures on this event each year. Maybe that doesn't make sense this year. Maybe it needs to be one salesperson. You talk about this in the investment reallocation piece, change the way that you're sponsoring it. Understand that instead of six figures, maybe you're spending two grand on that event. And you're understanding like, what should my right size budget be? Now that's very opposite end of the spectrum, pretty drastic change, but right size your budget in line with the expectations that you have from that show. And then look at where else could I use that investment to reallocate? So to my point about Coke Industries not showing up, if they're the person you wanted to go to at that event, try running an ABM, an account-based marketing campaign toward those buyers. Look at their industry or look at their company and say, hey, these eight, 10 people I need to get my name with, I'm going to run a direct mail campaign toward them with some disruptive direct mail. I'm going to run Google search ads. I'm going to run a LinkedIn campaign. My sales team is going to cold call them. We are going to target our efforts, money, and investment toward that. At the same time, instead of going from six-figure event spend to zero event spend and no presence, see about the opportunity to perhaps sponsor a cocktail hour at the event. Sponsor a networking activity. Have a dinner adjacent to it that you are telling the event about that you are using as part of it and you're you're, you're not leeching off the event. You are supporting in a different way that allows you to allocate some investment in a way that people remember, have, a, have an experience with. And even though you have less attendance at the overall show, the impact of what your sponsorship and investment did was more memorable for the people that you really care about. Just an idea on how to re reinvest your allocation there. 
You know, Joe, your point about, you know, so many of the, the people you interviewed saying, hey, we really don't know what impact this makes. We really don't measure it. You know, and I saw that for years. I mean, we attended trade shows where it was just, you know, and even the people we met with, I mean, luckily for us, you know, we met with those clients on a pretty regular cadence. But the one thing we did find was very beneficial was instead of sponsoring an event at a silver or gold or platinum level, do a dinner, do a cocktail hour. Like you mentioned, you have way more bang for your buck out of that, getting to spend that time than you do trying to spend big dollars to get your name, to get a speaker, you know, or, or something that to that point. But on the budget reallocation, w- one of the best things I have heard lately, and, and I, I want to recommend this guy, if you, if you don't follow him already, Chris Walker, who is the founder of Refine Labs, um, mm-hmm. has some great content about studies they have done because they work in B2B marketing as well. They consult with clients. And he has talked about how others have reallocated that budget and this is the golden opportunity. If you're a B2B company and you were looking for a way to fund a digital project, this is the time, right? Because you can justify pulling those dollars away from things like trade shows, which eat up, I mean, huge pieces of budget. And you can reallocate that to, hey, let's actually do something better with marketing automation. Let's actually try paid ad campaigns. Let's understand how to use LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Sales enablement. I mean, our company, has seen a lot of interest in our product from potential clients who say, I have to find a place to put my trade show budget. And because we can't meet with people personally, we want to invest into tools that can help us meet virtually. And that's what sales enablement does. Uh, Events and webinars like this. I mean, we've started a webinar series, you know, to try to engage clients when we can't see them in person. So I think so many ways to do that, but I think having being real with yourself and getting uncomfortable of just moving those dollars and recognizing that that trade show is not the end all be all is the first step, right? Like you have to get past that to start, to start moving down the other path. Totally. And I, and I think you brought up a good point there. I have to put my trade show dollars somewhere. I know for a lot of people inside of these organizations, budgeting gets set. If you don't use it, it will go somewhere else. If they're like, Oh, it's not getting used. We're going to put that into R and D. We're going to put that into engineering. We're going to put that into the another CapEx. And then you're going to fight just to get it back in some capacity. So look for the other ways you can use it. If you sit inside of that situation where you're like, I got to use this or it's gone. Very important to make sure that you don't let it be gone. Because when things start coming back and hey, now you have a digital platform. Now I want to drive people to my website. You're going to need dollars to go to those media campaigns. So it's it's a great point you make this. Yeah. Paul, did we have any questions come in? Nothing as of now, right now. Uh, Okay. Great. You guys had some good points on that topic. Awesome. So challenge number three, uh, this is historical in nature as well. Um, this was one that as I talked to manufacturing leaders in Indiana, across the country, California, it didn't matter where you were. Uh, the hiring obstacle was huge and, and always has been. People mentioned, hey, I'm definitely struggling with hiring more than usual, but I've always struggled with hiring. It's just worse. And it's worse across the board. It's not just finding people who can work on the line. It's also now finding like front office and, and skilled workers, uh, what we'll call like white collar workers inside of the manufacturing space. So just to give a little stat, I spoke with the uh, Economic Development Com- uh, Corporation here in Indiana, and this was as of December 4th, 2020. So before our state brought back really fully service jobs. So like restaurants were still under a lot of restrictions at that point here. Um, we still at that point saw a hundred thousand plus open jobs and an unemployment rate of 3.4% just in our state. That is effectively full employment. And there was a whole sector that hadn't even come back to work yet. And so there were these hundred thousand, by the way, the hundred thousand open jobs were in manufacturing. So 100,000 plus open jobs in manufacturing alone inside of a state that, you know, we do not, we are not California in terms of the population density and the size and the amount of impact we have on the economy. And so as you trace that across the the country, it's huge. Some of the reasons, so as we dug into that and said, hey, why are you struggling so much to find new, new employees, to find quality labor supply? There were so many things across the board. One of the ones we heard was, hey, every time unemployment benefits get pushed out or there's a stimulus check, 
my applications plummet for the next two weeks. People spend that money and then they come back up. That was in one anecdote we heard. We also heard, and this is one that was really hard to communicate inside of the report. So I'm going to use it in a verbal instead, because I think it's just easier to understand. I spoke with a CEO who uh, works for a um, source. They are, they are a recruiting and sourcing company for industrial manufacturing firms. He said, I used to be able to place that job at $17 an hour, and it was considered super premium. People were super excited to get that work. That same role has been increased to $23 or $25 an hour. I can't even get applications. That much of a change. Man, what happened? He said, well, there's a couple of things. One, women left the workplace in droves through 2020. He said, not because they even necessarily wanted to or didn't want to, or it wasn't anything that companies were doing to push women out. It was a situation in which, hey, I am largely the child caregiver for our family, right? For a variety of reasons, either what it was culturally inside of their home, husband made a little bit more money. So they said, hey, like you're the one who's going to need to come home and take care of our kids because I couldn't get child care taken care of. Schools were closed. And so women left to go do that role and then they didn't come back afterward. They were like, oh, this is actually, I either like it more or this is more realistic for my family or my kids still haven't gone back to school. So I still have to do this. Um, and so those, that whole subset of the workforce left. He said, I've seen way smaller numbers of women versus men coming out of this for, a, again, a, a variety of reasons. So that's, that's huge. And the other one is, frankly, the competitors have changed. Whereas in the past, it was all manufacturing organizations that really a lot of people didn't know a lot about. So you know, you're a normal person coming out of high school who might be looking for a line job um, you know, at, at 19 or 20 years old to start learning the trade. That person doesn't know any of the big manufacturers who hire. And so you're able to go recruit them. Well, now Amazon, Walmart, Wayfair, there are these huge e-commerce corporate companies that are able to hire that same staff and they know about them. They know who they are. So when they see the ad, they're already like, oh, all right, like Amazon, of course. And then frankly, the job at you know, an Amazon warehouse typically has air conditioning. It's a little bit less difficult than you know, metal work or something of that nature. And so the competition has changed. And now to get those same people to say yes to those job postings requires a greater value proposition um, than it did in the past. Now, one interesting thing we also observed while researching things coming out of uh, this one that I'm referencing here is from Yale University. They took a macro analysis, a meta study on what happens to hiring in response to relief bills. And they showed no across the board macro impact. And so this is one of those times where I think the right observation to make is neither, neither party is wrong. It's not that the people who see applications lowering every time there's a benefit released are incorrect, nor is it wrong that the study done by Yale University looking at a macroeconomic impact of stimulus checks is wrong either. The reality is, is that these are micro situations that are happening to you and you need to be prepared for them and how to handle them if they are happening to you. But it's not that that means you throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say that every stimulus is bad, right? You have to sort of take it case by case and understand what is the world that I live in? How does that affect my employment opportunities? So it's interesting to see sort of the, the juxtaposition of on the ground, here's what I'm feeling, and high in the sky research theory, here's what I'm seeing, and here's what studies are telling me. Um, it was very interesting. And I linked to a, a study done by a, a gentleman named... Uh, Michael from uh, Ball State University here in Indiana, he did a study on it as well. And he's an on the ground manufacturing marketer by trade. And he talks about this in more detail as well about what did COVID or what did COVID not have an impact on as far as the release of stimulus checks and, and all those things. And he actually sided with even from on the, on the ground, he, he sided with the Yale study. Um, but again, it doesn't make those stories coming out of individual companies any less, any less real. Um, it just means that it's not the only reason. You're not only seeing those applicants diminish because of benefits coming out of a COVID relief bill. So the question is, what do we do to solve for this employee problem? Well, frankly, if we could solve this with a magic wand, we'd be the most in-demand individuals in the world because it's such a challenging problem. But the first thing that we've done for some of our partners is treat it like a demand generation activity. 
And so in the same way, when I go out to look for new customers, I'm running things like paid advertising. I'm talking about my brand. I'm talking about why you should care about my product. That's what I do with my employees. So as I go out and I say, okay, I got to find people. What I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to find people who need to buy into my organization to work for us rather than to buy from us. Those are just a different value prop needed, but you can treat it in the same way. Run marketing campaigns towards them. Leverage your network. Talk to your local, local um, economic development groups who might have relationships with universities, with local community colleges, places that you can start to get your name out so people know about you. And then you can start com- to compete with these new brands I referenced before. We talked to a Fortune 500 chemical manufacturer and they said, hey, we only have one network where we can't get employees and it happened to be um, sort of Southeast Indiana, Kentucky, and, and into Missouri. And they said, everywhere else we're doing all right. And I said, What's the difference between those two? He said, well, in, in those two spots, there's an Amazon warehouse and a Walmart warehouse. And those two are really well known. So how do I solve the problem about the, the being well known thing? Well, you treat it like a demand generation activity to make sure that people, your ideal, your ideal employees as best you can, understand who you are and why they might want to work with you. The third piece there really plays into that is your overall brand perception and your culture matter everybody's paying more. Like I referenced earlier, that 17 an hour job is $23 an hour. It's $25 an hour. Everybody's paying more. And so you can't just walk in with a, I'll pay you more unless you're going to go. And at some point, the economy of scale on that position diminishes and you're not making money at at $45 an hour for a position that really should be 22. So you have to be smart about how much you just escalate that pay scale. So how do I get somebody in my door when I can't just go pay more constantly? Well, you start to build a culture that people care about and want to be a part of, and you build a brand that people respect and understand why they should care about it. And so this is where your messaging becomes very important. What your prospective employee cares about is very different than what your prospective buyer cares about. You need to make sure that you have a brand built around your employee situation that allows them to understand like, oh, I can see myself there. And here's why I should choose that over my five other options that are in front of me. You know, I think the real challenge on this is for the most part, it was a problem before COVID. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and also not only a problem for manufacturers and industrials, but for their customers. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to my old world in, in electrical distribution We had heard for the past six years that labor shortages of electricians and skilled tradesmen was a big issue. Mm -hmm. So, and and with that, it's kind of flown, you know, flowed back up through the supply chain. Um, And and just to be quite honest, I mean, one challenge that industrial is always up against is it's it's just not a very glamorous sort of sexy industry, right? And you've got younger workers that are looking for a place. To start their careers, you know, and Amazon is always more enticing than you know ABC metal products, and so it is. Yeah, it's a it's a huge challenge, and um, and the macroeconomics things you touched on, Joe, and who who really knows? I mean, we're we're all just making guesses at this point. Yeah, right. But in three years from now, we'll we'll begin to see. But you know, on top of that, you print three trillion dollars in stimulus. I mean, and let's keep politics out aside of this, but like. The likelihood that you're going to see inflation that is more than transitory, <laughs> you know, and, and and challenges with hiring and 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 wages and all those things, it just it exacerbates the problem. Yep. And uh, you know, it's 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 a real challenge. But I I love your recommendation though, Joe, around trying to let brand be a piece of that and trying to use almost like a demand gen engine to help fuel that because I think that is how you compete with folks like Amazon. And that again goes back to there's never been a better time than now to invest in marketing and put marketing at the seat or a seat at the executive table mm-hmm. to be have some influence on where it's taking a company, not just in, hey, what ads are we creating or you know content, but strategically in the direction of the company from a, a brand standpoint. I, I yeah, think that's yeah. such a good point. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, no, please, Paul. I was just going to say, we got a question here and I think this ties in perfectly, right? So um, we, we talk so much about brand and culture and, and sometimes you can feel lost in an organization if you're hiring and, and you have no one coming through your pipeline, right? You feel a little bit lost. So I mean, the question we have here is as a sales leader, how can I begin fostering change to attract more employees? Mm-hmm. Right? I think that's, that's such a good question because as an individual at a company, sometimes you feel like you're in a position of leadership and power, but 
how can you drive and foster this change, right? Are there things that I can do immediately? Maybe I can, I mean, salary is always one thing that, that you can look at, but that's not going to get people to stay, right? That's just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's yeah. probably a lot more than that with process, incentives, uh, the culture, right? On your team, how people communicate. So are there things you've noticed that that can help drive and foster some of that change? I think the first one is how to, how to, can you say his question again? I had it and now I'm, I'm yeah, as a sales leader, how can I begin fostering change or yeah. driving change? Yeah, I, th- I think to call out the problem is the first one. If there's not uni- unity around, like, we all agree this is a problem. Okay, great. Now we agree that's a problem. Okay, now let's evaluate some of the solutions that might be available for it. So I'd imagine leadership is all on board with, like, yeah, getting labor is a, is a challenge. The next step is to say, great, what have we tried? What happened out of that? Was it, was it effective? No? Well, now you have an open door to say, hey, I got some ideas about where we, could, <laughs> where we could try to do this differently. Like we're running our head into the wall. Are we tired of running our head into the wall? Yeah. I would also say that like, if you get down that path and everybody's looking around the room like we don't have any good ideas and nobody wants to go ask somebody for good ideas, that's a, that's a bigger organizational challenge than just the hiring piece. That's like, how are you going to make decisions about anything that you don't know how to do? Are you just going to keep like, no, we have to stay internal. We have to figure this out ourselves. Or are you going to go start getting some expertise to help you solve that problem? Um, I know that's kind of the expected answer from the outside consultant to say like, go hire somebody to help you do it. But I think if you, as a sales leader, it's very likely that you have a lot of frontline experience about what makes your company special. And you have to bring that up in sales conversations. Start to think about what, that, what makes it special to work there. And mm-hmm. start to articulate that in the same way that you would articulate, here's what makes it special. Or here's what makes our product special and differentiated. Think in that same way, but think about it from why do you work there? Like you individually, whoever asked the question, why do you work at the company that you work at? What makes you stay? It's probably not just money. I mean, you know, Hopefully you're getting paid fairly and well. But the reality is we could all go work for Cisco or Salesforce or some other massive company, IBM, and probably make a little bit more money than we do right now. So what is it that keeps us in our seats? And then think about that from the standpoint of your next employees. Yep. If you're hiring people to be on your sales team, yep. start to articulate that. If you're hiring people to be inside of the factory floor, you got to understand it from a different perspective again. But it really all comes back to like, why do we stay? What, do we, what makes us stay at this business? And then how can I articulate that in a message to prospective employees that gives them a value prop for being here that's bigger than the salary? Good points. Yeah. I'd like to make a prediction. I think over the next 24 months, I think we're going to see a lot of organizations, especially those sort of in that mid-market, you know, let's say 500 million to 2 billion. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of organizations experience turnover in the executive fold, specifically because, to your point earlier, Joe, what what have we tried that's not working? Okay, what are your other ideas? And if your other ideas of let's do more of the same thing we've done, if your company has a board, I mean, the the ability, and, and this is where I think industrial has been in a rut for two decades. They've done trade shows, right? We 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 literally spent twenty minutes of this call, 15, 20 minutes of this call, talking about trade shows. Yep. I mean, when I was again running uh, marketing at that distributor, we we found all sorts of old because I, I was there actually when we we turned eighty eight, and so we did a, a big thing about that that milestone. We found all these old pictures of when you know the company was founded back in the in the twenties, all the way up through the forties and fifties, and we would literally look at pictures from the fifties of counter days and trade shows. And if you just took a modern picture and turned it black and white, it looks the same. And, wow. and so I think, and again, going back to that prediction, I think that the big challenge and the thing we're dancing all around is it takes different focus and vision at a leadership level to make these changes in your company. It's not going to happen. You're not going to hire an intern and say, hey, go do LinkedIn and, and, or social media, and it's going to change. You're not going to hire you know, a 20-something to say, hey, join my sales team and I'm not going to give you any tools and you don't have a CRM and you do everything in spreadsheets. And by the way, our ERP is also our CRM. Go be successful. It's not going to work. Yep. So that's where I make the prediction. I think you're going to start seeing some companies either eventually just run off the cliff or boards or other investors step up and say, we have to think different. If you can't do it, we will find someone who can do it. Yeah. 
I think that's totally true. I think it's totally true. I know we're getting close on time, so I'm going to go ahead and move us over to the, the last one. So su supply chain, chain disruption was the other thing everybody mentioned. Um, supply chain's always been a challenge, but it's been highlighted a lot more. And the big piece I heard from leaders was, hey, multiple disruptions really stuck us in the hole we're in right now. And so with that, it was the exact line I heard was we were prepared for one of these four disruptions. We were prepared for either COVID, the Suez Canal blocking, the semi-chip shortage from China, or the Texas deep freeze. We were not ready for four of them. And so when four of them came within 12 months, exploded. What can we do? It's a real challenge. With that, at the same time, there became this huge abundance of demand for products, right? Everybody knows the housing market in the United States went nuts. With that, all the components, lumber went nuts, cars went nuts, all these things that went just gangbusters. So demand went through the roof while our supply chain started to fall apart. And so that was this interesting chicken or the egg, like, well, do we stop focusing on trying to generate demand, but we need to make more sales? What do we do? This sort of in-between space, and we'll get to that in the solution section. But those were two main things we heard. Everybody's in tons of demand and our supply chains are wrecked. With that, a lot of companies have been looking to nearshore. And when I say nearshore, I don't mean bringing manufacturing back to the United States. I don't mean that everything's getting made in America. But we're looking at, some things are, some things are being pulled back into American communities. But also choosing places like Mexico over places like China because it's closer, easier to get to, quicker relationship, quicker shipping times, cheaper. We're looking at all of those nearshoring trends becoming a, a major focus for people in the future. The other thing that's happening is, is companies are looking at what can I, as a, as a business, start to invest in from a in, uh, technology standpoint so that I can own this without having to worry about it outside of my gates. And so that's even things that go back into the employee conversation around Hey, what are the what are the sort of lowest skill level jobs that I have the highest turnover in that I could automate with technology? At the same time, what technology op like opportunities are there that don't have rare earth materials in them? But for example, uh, magnets that don't use rare rare earth, which largely comes from China. How do I develop magnets that don't need that? Like companies are looking into questions like that, and they're partnering with. Um, tech startups and they're partnering with sort of new innovative thinkers to try to drive some of that innovation thinking so that they can stop having some of these supply chain issues, not just now, but for the future as well. Where is it going in the long run? And then there's just a huge question around the sales and marketing activities that should or should not be done inside of the supply chain when it looks like this. Like when my supply chain is this tough and my demand is this high, what does sales and marketing need to be doing? And it was really another kind of like the event, the event one, a little bit of a shrug of like, what do we do with that? And the question almost played back and forth. And so as we look at solutions for this, what I do not have is a silver bullet to fix your actual supply chain problems. Nobody has that. The thing does not exist, right? The thing that you need, the semiconductor chip, for example, inside of cars, it ain't here. So there's nothing I can give you that's going to solve that problem. So as we speak to this one, this is an example of our clients and what we're telling our clients to do and how we're helping them navigate the supply chain challenge. The biggest, most important thing is to, first of all, evaluate your buying process and what needs to happen inside of that that relates to supply. So if your buying process is such, I actually jumped to number four there on the Joybird example. This is the best way to think about this. Joybird makes furniture. As you know, if you go to buy a couch right now, you're looking at like three to five months, depending on who you're buying it from, to wait for your couch. In the past, before you hit the purchase button for Joybird, you would go through and design your couch. You'd pick your materials. You'd pick your color. You'd pick your size. All these things, all these steps. You take all these steps, then you'd purchase it, and you'd get your couch in relatively quick order. I think somewhere between two and four weeks. Well, they had a six-month waiting time. So what they did, instead of having you do all of this before purchasing, they actually flipped their buying process on its head. And they said, you're going to make a, a determination right up front if you're going to buy with us because we need to make sure we can get your product. Now, after you make your purchase decision, we are going to go through the building process. You are going to pick out sample. You're going to get samples sent to you. You're going to get to pick out what color your couch is after you buy it. 
So now what happens is as a buyer, I'm getting the fun part of designing my piece of furniture for a much longer period of time. And now by the time that I'm done with all the steps of designing this thing, I'm actually three quarters of the way through my waiting period. And now I'm going to get my couch in my normal two to four week period, like I would have beforehand. And so you can take that same idea and think about your buying process and how can you actually flip it a little bit so that your experience, your customer is making a quicker decision to necessarily work with you, but then you're going through all the stages you would go through anyway. It's like, hey, do we want to work together? And they're like, yeah, I want to work with you. Great. Now we're going to go through design and, and all these questions that you have inside your buying process and sort of flip that as an idea. The, the other solution that we've seen be really important is to individualize your communication. The biggest mistake we saw across the board with manufacturing companies was slapping up a banner at the top of the website that had our COVID-19 response. And it was just this blanket statement about due to COVID-19, we are having delayed shipping times. You can expect your products to arrive four to six weeks later than usual. Thank you. Click. That is the antithesis of individualized communication. When we talk about individualized communication, this is not just to your customers, but also to your sales team, to your internal team saying, hey, here's the reality of the situation. This is the delay that we're looking at. Here's why that's going on. Here's how that affects your customers. And going to your sales team and talking about that and empowering them to talk to their customers so that they can have that conversation with them and say, hey, here's what's going on. The reality is we can't get steel right now. We're on about a six-week waiting period to get this component that's part of what you've ordered. I'm going to keep you up to date the whole time. I'm going to tell you when it hits our floor. I'm going to tell you when it's in production. I'm going to let you know when it leaves our warehouse. I'm going to let you know when you can expect to receive it. And I'm going to individualize the communication based on your order so that you know what's going on. Our experience has been that customers are exceptionally understanding because they're also experiencing the same thing you are. They know the supply chain is messed up. They know that it's hard to get components right now. So if you don't act like pie in the sky, this is our COVID statement, sort of like, I am a big corporation, and you get a lot more human, people respond really well to it. So be human, talk to them, tell them what's going on and get really transparent with your own supply chain. Tell them what's happening. Let them know where the, where the break is, tell them why, and just be real about it. The more real you can be, the better people are reacting to it. And then the other one I have here, the competitors are in the same situation. Um, this is a good example. I'll use Airstream as a good example here. Airstream makes luxury travel trailers and they were way oversold. Like they just, they were like, guys, we can't even fulfill our orders right now. What do we do? Do we like turn off all of our marketing activities? Do we like, help us understand this? And we said, how long is your normal sales cycle? They said, yeah, anything from 18 to 24 months. Great. So do you think in 18 or 24 months, the buyer who's evaluating you right now is going to be looking at buying you then? Yeah, for sure. Okay. In 18 to 24 months, do you expect to have units to sell? Yes, 100%. Okay. You need to keep talking to that buyer. If you can go back and say, what is my buying cycle and how long do I need to get ahead of the curve? That can start to indicate what sort of marketing do you do at any given time to make sure that you still have a full pipeline for your future state. Because the reality is that the most likely situation is that if you are experiencing a, a strain on your supply chain that is affecting your ability to fill demand, your competitors who have the same inputs are also in the same situation. And so if you drop the ball on communicating that clearly with your potential customers, your competitor is going to pick them up, communicate well, tell them when they can expect the product and take that sale from you. So don't stop talking to your potential customers because you can't service them right now. Recognize that everybody can't service them right now. And so now the differentiation becomes who can give me the best customer experience while I wait to get this piece. That is the thing that now differentiates you, not just your product or even your sales team services. Who can educate me, communicate with me, and give me a good buyer experience given the current situation that I'm in? Yeah, I think there are a lot of good points in there. I think that you, you summarized that really well. I, I don't think you can ever over communicate um, at all. I think that that's something that teams need to place more of an emphasis on. That Joybird example was a phenomenal example too of how they flip that script on the head, right? I think that teams need to do that more often, right? The ingenuity behind that is is 
amazing. They basically took the resources that they had and just found a way to make it more comfortable for their their buyers. Another small example of that is you might know the story as well, but Houston Airport, they had a lot of complaints from the people waiting at baggage lines. So mm-hmm. what they did was they actually moved the baggage to the farthest point of the airport, uh, airport. So people would have to spend 10 minutes walking to the baggage. And by the time they got to their baggage, their baggage was there. And so they eliminated and they reduced that nine minute wait time wow. that they had. So I, I just place such an emphasis on that, right? Actually taking a look at our process, stepping outside of the box. Are there things we can change? Is there some ingenuity we can add? And I think COVID has definitely given teams the time to do that recently. That is super interesting. Yeah. It's not even like the Houston example. They actually didn't address the problem. Like just, there wasn't there wasn't actually a problem. It was like I, I don't want just to just divert it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or yeah, you've just kind of covered it, masked it, but still it's the comfort level. Right now, your customers are comfortable. It's yeah. the same thing. Well, they don't need to solve it. It's it they just needed to change. Like the, the customers didn't even care about the 10 minutes for their bag. What they cared about was having to stand in the same place for 10 minutes. So how do I help them just be walking for the 10 minutes? And then they get there and they're like, Oh great, my bag is here, and they're out there happy and they're on their way. Exactly. So goes a long way. I thought that was a great example. It's a great example. Well, Joe, I, we're right at the end of time and uh, this has been a, a great discussion. Paul, did we have any other questions that, that came in through Q&A? I think we had, we had answered them already. I don't see any uh, remaining ones right now. We should be okay. Excellent. Well, well, we'll go ahead and, and, and wrap up here just for sake of time. Um, first and foremost, Joe, thank you so much for, for joining this. The research that you guys have done is, is great. And so we're going to make this available as well. Uh, if you're on the call, we will send out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webinar that you can watch. Uh, we're also going to include Joe's slide deck in there. I'll include Joe's LinkedIn uh, link as well. So if you want to reach out to him, I know you're active on LinkedIn. If you want to start a conversation, please do. Uh, I'll include mine and Paul's information uh, as well. Uh, and we'll put a couple other things in there. We've got some other resources uh, for manufacturing and industrial. If you're interested in learning how to handle sales and marketing during this time, I'll post a couple of links uh, to some additional articles there as well. Um, but we really appreciate everybody taking time to join. This is one of many webinars that we're going to be doing uh, for the remainder of the year. So if you've enjoyed the content you've seen here today, please check out our other webinars and consider joining for more great guests like Joe. So again, thanks so much for joining Joe and we uh, we really appreciate the, the commentary. Yeah, thank you guys as well. Really enjoyed the conversation and uh, always great to learn from you.